again. And yes, I'm a Christoph Müller. I'm a clinical academic consultant, old age psychiatrist in the Maudsley and at the IOP. And um, yeah, and I basically use uh, clinical back data or what we call the clinical record interactive search system uh, to research routine dementia care. And I, I'll tell you a little bit more um, about this. Um, so this is the overview. First of all, I just as an introduction, I want to tell you a little bit more why it is important to actually use routinely clinical data, routinely collected data from our clinical services in dementia research, then tell you a bit more about our data source, the clinical record interactive search system, and then finally give you some examples about dementia with Lewy bodies, which is just one application of, um, of this uh, database and type of research we are doing. I guess the, uh, I mean, I, I don't need to tell you much about the importance of dementia, of course, it is, it is an increasing public health problem, it is on the rise, and it has also been identified as the leading cause of death. So it's, it's frequently recorded now on death certificates. But I think one problem um, with, with dementia is, and that has already been recognized by the Alzheimer's Society a while ago, that uh, dementia rarely travels alone. And that basically means that people with dementia um, often have not just dementia, but but various other both psychiatric and physical health conditions in addition to having dementia, so or what we would call multimorbidity. And I think I, I always kind of like this graph from data actually from Scotland, which really shows how much comorbidity people with dementia have and kind of only this little dot in the right corner, those 5% are the people with dementia who just have dementia, but the others will both have mental and physical comorbidities, often four to five. And that is really problematic um, because the data we are getting on those other conditions um, are often done in clinical trials that exclude older people and that exclude uh, people with dementia specifically. Here are just a few examples like about uh, kind of, I think the first one is about kind of um, heart failure drugs or with heart failure drugs or uh, kidney problems or diabetes. So often people with dementia are not really, or older people even, are not represented in those trials. And we don't really know if kind of a medication that is effective in those trials actually works in real life settings in our populations, the populations we are looking after. And kind of this just to show that managing multimorbidity, again, being mentally or physically, is really complicated. It's like it's a chess game. But if dementia kind of comes into the picture, it really becomes a three-dimensional chess game as, of course, I mean, carers of people with dementia will tell you how, how difficult it is to go, for example, to all those hospital appointments they need to attend for all the, the other physical illnesses they have. And, of, and we also know very little, for example, about how effectively to manage depression in dementia and are also kind of really still struggling with finding a right uh, medication or, or a psychological approach to, to address psychosis in dementia. So, and I think maybe looking at the data we have from our clinical services can give us important insights into this. And this is kind of just a, the first point I want to make. The second point is um, about kind of the, the cohorts in which sometimes clinical trials are conducted in comparison to kind of more clinical cohorts. And I guess, and I guess, I guess you all know the mini mental state examination where um, you get a score uh, out of 30. And if, I guess if the score is below 24, roughly, you would often say uh, the person has dementia. But I guess in just in your mind, maybe make, make a guess how high is actually would be the MMSE score of a 10 year old. So what, what do you think what their what their MMSE score would be, because I think there was a, there was a study in the US where they basically had um, 510 year olds uh, at an elementary school, as they call it, and they, they, they completed the MMSE. And actually, uh, the average score in this cohort was 28.6. So at the time, actually, we diagnosed dementia, um, a person needs to have quite a significant cognitive decline. I think that was the point the authors wanted to make. If you now uh, think, okay, an average 10 year old has kind of an MSE of 28, we make a diagnosis of dementia, maybe a, um, if someone has an MSE below 24, what would you think is the, was the average MMSE score in all trials of the antipsychotic risperidone? So risperidone, the only antipsychotic 
that is licensed to be prescribed in dementia for persistent aggression where there is a risk to self or others. Um, and I think I give you the solution in the next slide um, because that was only 8.5. So this is probably a very different cohort that was in where they recruited more than a thousand people um, to, to trial risperidone and, and, and demonstrated effectiveness of that drug. I think in comparison, what do you think is the average MMSE score at death? So there is one study that was done on the UCL uh, CRIS system where they looked into um, what was the last MMSE score recorded before the person died. And that was about 15.3. So kind of the bottom line is a, a lot of people with, who die with dementia are not in the, in the later stages of dementia. And I guess this score is already almost twice as high as the score was in the risperidone trials. And when we diagnose patients with dementia in our clinical services, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, I think the average MMSE score lies by 18.6. And I think that is, um, as a clinician, is probably more the population we are kind of dealing with than this uh, 8.5 care home population. Um, where probably most of our, us as clinicians wouldn't even uh, be doing an MSE. That would, we would say, well, that um, they are already quite severely impaired. Nevertheless, of course, clinical trials are very important to establish if a, if, if a drug works, but then I guess we need to do the next step and look for whom it works and in which circumstances it might work better and for whom uh, it, it might not be as effective. And to do this, we um, use the anonymized health records of the South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust, so which is kind of a big, pure mental health trust uh, in southeast of London. So we provide the, uh, both the mental health and dementia care for the residents of the boroughs of Lambeth, Croydon, Suffolk and Lewisham, where there are roughly like 1.4 million people um, who live there at the moment. And, um, and they provide us, I think, about 400,000 records. So we have an electronic patient record system that has been established since 2006, only for the Mental Health Trust. And this has then been reworked largely under the, uh, under the leadership of Rob Stewart to make that available for anonymized research um, since 2009 or so. And that is via the Clinical Record Interactive Search System. So on your left, you see that that is our kind of where we put on all the patient data, where we write our notes and put in the diagnosis and put on various uh, tests and scores we have done. And this has more than 400,000 active cases. As I said, it was set up in 2007-8. There has been a constant rebuilding and enhancement going on, and it has produced more than 120 research papers. And it has also been successfully report, uh, exported to other trusts. Um, and there are some which, with which we are really working very closely, like UCL or Cambridge, and, but there has also been a wider UK CRIS system set up uh, with which other trusts are using who are not working as closely with us. And with, from now from the original data source, the data gets de-identified and there's something called the front end, which is just, um, you can just type in some search terms and then you as a clinician or as a researcher can read about what, what's about that in the record. That's more like for smaller exploratory or audit type projects. And if you want to do a larger scale research project, um, we usually have programmers who, who, who program via SQL code and they, the output is then very long Excel tables with lots of uh, columns. So just more like a, a research data set um, you're probably more, more used to, I guess. And what was really, important in the beginning when this was set up is just um, kind of the whole governance process and the, the team was very good at right from the beginning because they put patients really at the heart of the center of setting up the CRIS system and governing it so there's so when I want to do a project I need to apply to an oversight committee and this oversight committee is led by a patient and ultimately they will decide is this a project where we can use this anonymized patient data for is that, is that basically ethical and useful or, or not in a way. And in the initial consultations, I think patients were extremely positive about this uh, resource and they, they were rather assuming, um, isn't that going on anyway? I'm contributing so much of, of 
data into the healthcare system that should be available for research rather than saying, oh, I, I'm, I'm too worried about my confidentiality. But of course, you, you have to, to put in all um, the reassurances that confidentiality is not, not broken, of course. And everything that happens within the CRIS system actually happens within the firewall of the mental health trust. So nothing kind of goes onto a university computer, for example. So we, so, and this is kind of the data we can get from the, from our patient record, specifically from structured fields. And I mean, from structured fields, I guess that's what you roughly can get about the, the journey of a patient to the healthcare system. You, you get basically intervention context. So the patient comes in the system, how, what are their demographics? What is their diagnosis? And of course the, the honor scores we are using and, and maybe why they are coming in. You get a little bit about the intervention, how often they are they in contact with mental health services, are they admitted, discharged to, to the ward, and what might be the outcomes of it. So, but all you can basically also get from, from this, those tables from the patient record is maybe service contact, admission, discharge, how long they stayed. And again, those honor scores, I think, so those I think are where we are relatively religiously uh, recorded because they were initially be thought to be part of a payment by result system that never came through. Um, so they are very annoying for us as clinicians, but very, very helpful for us as researchers because they, they give us a zero to four scale from no problem to very severe problem, I, I guess, in the most important areas um, of the patient presentation. Um, and a lot of research scales, like for example, a neuropsychiatric inventory, there will also not be much more detailed on those, on those domains. I guess the difference just with routinely collected data is that it's completely up to the clinician when they think it's useful to collect the data um, and, and when they think, when they don't collect it. While if you have, of course, a, a, a normal cohort study and the patient comes back every year, you know you will have a data point every year. Um, while in routinely collected data, the data points are scattered all around and you need to kind of make statistical adjustments for that or I guess use some mixed models to just account for different time periods between so when certain interventions take place. Um, but overall, of course, that, that there is still quite little you can get from only the structured fields in your mental health, in your, in your patient record and there were kind of uh, two major enhancements to, to this um, data source have been undertaken in the last 10 years. And I'm again going to start with adding linked data. So basically linking to other databases, um, linking to other contexts, to other institutions the patients might be in contact with. And again, this gives you some information about um, why they are coming into your service and in which condition they are coming in you, into your service. And of course, they give you very in, interesting outcome data. And I mean, of course, I'm going to talk about the outcome data I'm largely using in dementia, but you know, this is an, an overview also that might already be slightly outdated um, to what the, the CRIS system has been linked or is in the process of being linked. And I think for, for the patients with dementia, of course, they're at the end of towards the end of their life, mortality is relatively important and hospitalization. So that is hospital admissions to, to general hospitals, which we get in England and Wales from kind of national hospital statistics. So we can kind of see of our patients who come into our system and get a diagnosis of dementia in their patient journey. How are they admitted to other hospitals and why are they admitted to other hospitals for physical health reasons? Um, of course, we, we are quite interested in establishing a linkage to primary care because primary care data is just um, covers the patient journey often much better than, than secondary care data where the patient dips in and out. But then, of course, that poses its own challenges in just how the data is curated with complicated coding system and so forth. And um, what can be quite interesting are, for example, individual census records. So how deprived is the area where the patient lives? Or, I mean, this often also gives kind of information on ethnic density and, and, and other such variables, which can give quite interesting results. And I guess one, one more, something that has become quite interesting recently is also kind of environmental data, um, like for example, air pollution and, 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 and such things. Uh, 
and, and this is also increasingly being used. And I guess we, we also want to use it, especially as kind of as, uh, some studies have shown that, for example, air pollution increases your dementia risk. So we would be interested to, to see if that actually also affects how people with dementia are progressing or are faring once they are diagnosed with the condition. And I think, but the two most important ones, at least for me and my research, um, are I think hospital admissions um, in people with dementia. And of course, I mean, I mean, everyone gets admitted to hospitals, but it is also in a way um, an, an outcome that you want to avoid if you can, especially kind of avoidable hospital admissions. And um, and and hospital admissions are often kind of they they will haste uh, will make the dementia progress more rapidly. Um, so, but in, when I ever I extract the data set of, of our patients from, say, from 2008 to 2018, actually kind of 33% of those patients will have had a hospital admission after their dementia diagnosis, and about half of them will have, have already passed away by the time of, of data extraction. So this, those are outcomes that are very common for, for people with dementia. Um, just link data, of course, linking data to a, to a mental health data set gives an incredible richness and tells basically the, it opens the book of life of the patient with kind of various chapters in various services and how those are interlinked but it's of course very very sensitive data and uh, you need to work uh, very carefully with it and you need to kind of really to recognize um, that that this is kind of that the patients are kind of giving this to you and, and making it available for research. And I think the, and that's why the, the team uh, at, at the Maudley has set up basically a data linkage service user and care advisory group um, who kind of scrutinize complex linking uh, problems or linking requests or even complex problem requests, which has kind of, um, and this is a, a really great group of kind of mental health service users who really scrutinize every project and, um, I mean, whenever I have gone to them, they, they are really, um, they're almost like an interview panel. So you, you save one mock interview if, if you can, if you get the chance to speak to them. And, and it also kind of shows that, I mean, data linkages also, the, it, it look, the, the, system, the principle looks very easy. It is actually very, very complicated in terms of its governance and also in terms, in terms of um, making it, it all ethical in a way. And I mean, on the left, I've just just one example about a study where we where we use data linkages, and where we just wanted to see which variables which we we can ascertain from our data predict people with dementia having a hospitalized fall. So we were taking people from our clinical record interactive search system from our mental health record, and found out when they were diagnosed with dementia, what characteristics they had when they were diagnosed with dementia, and which of those characteristics predicted then having them having a fall, a hospitalized fall later in their disease course. And um, what we found is it's just very busy, so those, those, but those are, for example, variables we can use. I mean, we found, of course, that if you are older, you are more likely to have a fall. If, you, if people have, live alone, they are more likely to have a hospitalized fall. Um, if you are from a more deprived area, more likely to have a hospitalized fall. Um, ethnic minorities seem to be protected from having hospitalized falls. Interestingly, people with depressed mood seem to have a higher risk and people and various medications seemed to play a role also in kind of in what, what predicts risk of a hospitalized fall in a person with dementia. Um, but those are all the unadjusted analysis. And then what we did, we just mutually adjusted everything. And what we found was quite interesting that all of the um, modifiable risk factors as like medications or mental health symptoms um, became insignificant. But what remained significant was just problems with living conditions. So if people really had um, living conditions that were not conducive to to them living there and probably po posing quite a few false hazards um, that remained the main in one of the main independent risk factors for having a fall. So I guess what we concluded from this is, um, I mean, it, it is all well and good and important to have false clinics that look at medications, for example, that, cause, that can cause falls. And um, 
look at other factors you could maybe influence to, to uh, avoid the people falling. What you definitely need to do is send someone to the patient's home and make sure there are no trip hazards and so forth that the patient's home is, is adjusted just to their needs. And, and, then, and then the other things will provide additional value, but that seems to be the most important area. Another, so, the sec, so that was kind of the first expansion to the CRIS data set where the, where the data linkages. The second one were text analytics. And kind of this is just a picture of lead in books, I think in, from Anselm Kiefer in, in, the, in the library, uh, in a museum in Oslo. And, and I guess that that is a problem we encounter a lot uh, in psychiatry because we just, we as clinicians tend to write everything in free text and don't like to put anything into structured field and structured boxes at all. And you will basically in the patient letter, the free text letter or the kind of the events or progress note entry will contain all the information, but that's not immediately accessible unless you kind of have someone who, who, who reads all those records and you probably have done all, all have done this for some audit project. That's why kind of the, the second um, expansion of the, the CRIS resource was kind of using natural language processing. So having the computer space, having a computer software to read the record for you. And I think it, it all started even, I mean, before, long before I joined the team, um, with actually when a PhD student was looking at MMSE scores because we were, they were interested in cognitive decline and how that goes over time. And there is a, a box where uh, clinicians can put in the MMSE score on the system. But um, in the so-called structured fields, they found 8,000 MMSE scores. And in the text, in the letters and the events, they almost found 80,000 MMSE scores. So if you only concentrate on structured fields, you're missing most of the information. And, and that was kind of one, one of the main reasons why this program of natural language processing was developed, um, where you basically just train a computer to pick up the instances from free text that you want. And I think you, you basically, you give the, the, the programmer or the computer, I mean, there's various softwares and approaches. I mean, this, the gate software from the University of Sheffield has been used a lot in, in our system. And you, you give the computer some information, what you want. The computer then gives you some output, which you then have to check again and tell the computer, I, I, here you got it right, there you got it wrong, um, and then go back to them. and and train it in a way. And that goes a little bit back and forth. Um, I mean, there's a whole team around this and this is just my, my clinician's understanding of this. And, and for example, other methodologies like machine learning can certainly support also the computer develop those applications. And then this is just a, a small overview of, I think the, there are close to a hundred natural language processing applications to just get this information um, out of the, the free text clinicians are writing. I mean, and a lot, a lot of this has been developed by our colleagues in the psychosis and affective disorders field who just wanted to have kind of positive symptoms, negative symptoms recorded or kind of even catatonia if you want to, I mean, want to look for something that is a little bit more rare. A large routinely collected database will at least relatively quickly help you find those patients and, and affective symptoms, behavior, I think kind of for the dementia context, of course, cognitive function, the specific dementia subtype diagnosis um, and other elements around the patient. Are they living alone or more recently, are they lonely? Are they socially isolated? Again, I think from the kind of uh, psychosis colleagues, more the substance use or kind of also the substance misuse clinics as well. I mean, in terms of interventions in, in also in psychiatric records, Medications can be put in in a structured field, but nobody does it. So I guess an, an application needed to be developed to, to find out which medications the patients are actually on or which psychotherapy they are getting. And also I kind of in, in dementia, I'm more interested really in those hard outcomes as mortality and hospitalization. Um, natural language processing can also help us to find out a bit more about are they improving or are they getting worse in their general health or in their symptoms. And I, But I think some of those are still kind of in production. Um, so, but I wanted to go back to the diagnosis and also kind of go a little bit more in the di direction of dementia with Lewy bodies, because there is actually no good ICD-10 code to, to um, 
co-dimensional with Lewy bodies. And there's various um, different coding practices around this uh, here. And I guess, I mean, I think we were initially told to use F0 2.8. I mean, if you really want to get it right, you could should code the neurology code G31.83. Um, I mean, but even if you use the F0 2.8, you're still coding for lots of other diseases. And if you then just generate a co cohort based on that code and say, yeah, they have dementia with Lewy bodies, um, and you might, you might get it wrong in quite a number of cases. And that's why we use the natural language processing to specifically look for diagnostic terms where a clinician said the diagnosis of this patient is dementia with Lewy bodies to uh, generate larger cohorts of, uh, of patients with Lewy bodies. And that is kind of a, a larger ongoing project also very closely collaborating with Cambridge. Um, just from the uh, dementia point of view, so some, some just natural language processing application, I have just run over um, a cohort of patients, our cohort of patients with dementia, which is like roughly 20,000 to look what, what is actually there at the time of dementia diagnosis. What do they have in, time, in terms of neuropsychiatric symptoms, uh, which I can ascertain via NLP. And um, we, we clearly see um, why, why dementia is part of kind of psychiatry here in the, in the UK because neuropsychiatric symptoms are quite prominent. Also, of course, those are the patients referred to us. Also, in our patch, there's very little in terms of kind of neurology and geriatric memory clinics. So I think we would see the majority of uh, patients with dementia and also make the diagnosis. Um, and you can just see, I mean, the, the, the orange line are patients with Alzheimer's disease and the blue line is with any dementia. Um, and you, you can basically also see that, for example, apathy seems to be more common in Alzheimer's disease than in other forms of dementia, just from this very coarse analysis. Um, but now lastly, let me go to the, the last chapter, which is dementia with, with Lewy bodies, where I want, just wanted to give a few examples. I mean, um, I mean dementia with Lewy bodies had gained some attention after the, uh, the death of the actor Robin Williams by suicide in the context of uh, undiagnosed dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, and only like two or three months later, when they really did the autopsy, they found in his brain autopsy that he had severe Lewy body pathology. And subsequently his, his uh, third wife, Susan Schneider Williams, she became an, kind of a bit of an advocate for Lewy body dementia, which is of course, which is important in, in the American context. It's always good to have kind of a uh, celebrity advocate for this and has had written um, this editorial also about uh, the experience of Lewy body dementia in, in, in his later years and where she kind of just describes the describes a firestorm of symptoms and he was really struggling with constipation, urinary difficulty, heartburn, sleeplessness, insomnia, a poor sense of smell and lots of stress and it was really they, they couldn't get to grips with what it was. I mean also he, he has had been he hadn't been drinking alcohol for years. they sent him kind of for rehabilitation. Um, he saw a neurologist that was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and he was started on, on again a dopamine ag agonist. Um, but somehow it didn't all end up and uh, ultimately, I mean, he committed suicide. And that has recently also been kind of, there has been a documentary, which I haven't seen yet, but in early uh, September, kind of this documentary about this Louis body dementia journey of his uh, has kind of come to, to the cinemas or where you kind of the online streaming services. Um, just very briefly about Louis body dementia. It, it's just, it's always very confusing. It's of course, it's named after uh, Friedrich Levy, or kind of, he changed his name after he had emigrated to the US into a Frederick Levey, I think just because um, he wanted to work at the, at, at the University of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he thought it would be better to have that name that, than his kind of original um, German Jewish name. And um, Louis body dementias, the term is used kind of, if you say Louis body dementias, it's just an umbrella term that includes clinically diagnosed dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease. So that's any dementia where Lewy bodies are present. We use the term Parkinson's disease dementia when the dementia starts one year or more after well-established patient Parkinson's disease. 
And the term dementia with Lewy bodies is dementia that occurs before or concurrently with Parkinsonism or within one year of onset of motor symptoms. However, not all patients develop Parkinsonism. And I guess in my um, clinical practice, the Parkinsonism is often, or often very subtle and rarely needs the uh, prescription of dop dopamine agonists. And I guess this has, of course, been often um, criticized. And why is it one year? Is it really useful? Um, and in the clinical context, you, you could, I think there's really a bit of leeway to, to think, is that useful or not? I guess most people with Parkinson's disease dementia, they will have just Parkinson's disease for a number of years, not just one year, and, and then develop dementia. Um, and then we can relatively confidently make that diagnosis. And in patients with dementia with Lewy bodies, however, because they often present with a wide array of symptoms that are often very, very confusing. Um, to both the patients and clinicians and diagnosis are often delayed. Um, and the Parkinsonism might be a small part of it, might come later or might not occur at all. Just really, really fairly quickly recap the uh, diagnostic features of dementia with Lewy bodies. Of course, to diagnose dementia with Lewy bodies, someone needs to have dementia. Um, whereby the tricky bit about dementia with Lewy bodies is that it often pr presents with attentional, executive, and visual spatial dysfunction. Um, and that is something that in the classical kind of cognitive tests like the MMSE uh, gets relatively little attention. So I think, I mean, there is a little bit of drawing which tests visual spatial function. There's no real testing of, of executive function in, in the MMSE, for example. and um, and attention can also be a bit um, tricky to measure. Um, and often you, you sometimes see those patients with quite advanced dementia with Lewy bodies, but no memory problem uh, or a relatively preserved memory. And nobody believes you that they actually have dementia, which sometimes I've experienced like in liaison settings. And then, I mean, to make the diagnosis, they need since two core features, which is either the fluctuating cognition um, recurrent visual hallucinations that are typically well formed and detailed. That is probably the most easy uh, core feature to pick up. The REM sleep behavior disorder, um, which is very tricky to pick up, especially if a person doesn't have like a bed partner, or one or more spontaneous features of Parkinsonism, like bradykinesia, tremor, or rigidity. Also, those can really be relatively mild, and, and it can only really be one. And you often wouldn't even get that if, if you don't look for it, for example. And then if there's only one core feature, you could add an addictive biomarker, which is a dopamine scan or a, um, an abnormal, an, an MIBG, as a myocardial scintigraphy, which has kind of been de developed in Japan, has been working there relatively well to distinguish Lewy body dementia from Alzheimer's disease. I think here it still is to be seen if what applies kind of to, to Japanese hearts also applies to, to European hearts, especially given the, there's often much more cardiac comorbidity here and people are also taking more medications for that. And if you have access to a polysomnography to confirm REM sleep without atonia, so REM sleep behavior disorder, that is also a very strong indicative biomarker. And, and even if, if you have a history of a REM sleep behavior disorder and you and you then do a polysomnogram and that's confirmed, that's very, very indicative of, of dementia with Lewy bodies. This is just from the uh, Cambridge CRIS system, our colleagues in Cambridge, and they have kind of been looking at what are the earliest signs of patients with uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, so what do they come in our service with? And it's a really mixed bag, so kind of half with memory problems, half with hallucinations which would be the ones we are probably expecting, but then a lot with like low mood, confusion, delusions, anxiety. So it is really tricky. And it, it's then often quite a long journey for those patients until the uh, correct diagnosis is established. Um, nevertheless, it is very important to establish that diagnosis. Also, um, maybe treatment options are not that different from Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, dementia with Lewy bodies just has a very adverse prognosis uh, than Alzheimer's disease. And I think I go through this relatively quickly. Um, so cognitive decline is very difficult to measure. We are not quite sure if, um, of course, when the MMSE is used, which is used in most longitudinal studies, it is just not a very good marker of, of 
cognition in people with dementia with Lewy bodies. And there's probably a need to follow those patients up with a bit more with tests that uh, test more the domains where they fall down with, like for example, the MOCA. But what is relatively clear that survival until severe dementia is uh, much shorter in patients with uh, dementia with Lewy bodies and patients who have dementia with Lewy bodies and comorbid Alzheimer's pathology, be that measured in an MRI scan or as here in the uh, CSF, they also do much worse in their cognition, which, which of course makes sense. I mean, we meta-analyzed all studies measuring survival and we found basically that survival in dementia with Lewy bodies is almost two years shorter from diagnosis than in patients with Alzheimer's disease. I think we, we came at uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease, we came on, on average time about six years and about four years for dementia with Lewy bodies. And again, having kind of comorbid uh, Alzheimer's pathology kind of yeah, this is again from the Cambridge data, just really from the routinely collected data. If you have, um, you, you live longer if you don't have additional symptoms of Alzheimer's disease or if a non, so people who have a non amnestic cognitive impairment, they live a bit longer than those who also probably have like a hippocampal involvement and subsequently more uh, amyloid and tau pathology. Um, I, what I did with our data, it is also linked to death certificate data from the Office of National Statistics. So we can look at what, what people are dying of. Um, and what I wanted to do is just find out, um, maybe is there anything in the death certificate that tells me why people with dementia with Lewy bodies are dying earlier than people with patients with Alzheimer's disease. But um, so I've been looking at the primary cause of death. Um, and then an underlying cause of death, but I'm, I'm actually not much the wiser. There didn't seem to be much of a difference in, in the primary causes of death between those two groups. The only signal I found is, of course, Parkinson's disease. There will be more Parkinson's disease on the death certificates of people with Lewy body dementia, which was very interesting that there was much less cancer recorded um, on, on the death certificates of people with Lewy body dementia than in patients with Alzheimer's disease, both as a primary and as the underlying cause of death. Um, people with Lewy body dementia are much quicker admitted to nursing homes. I mean, there's not many studies, but a Norwegian study found just that they are it's almost 1.8 years earlier. And I think we think that is largely related to having all those neuropsychiatric symptoms early in the disease course, which thus leads to such a high caregiver burden that they can't be managed anymore at home. They need to be admitted to nursing homes, which increases costs. There have been a number of cost studies. I think the most recent and a really large one from the US uh, showed just if you, that the total cost, um, mean annual cost of Lewy body dementia is almost twice the cost of Alzheimer's disease. And, and a Norwegian study also uh, showed that it really increases over time. Um, and it's already quite high at baseline and, and increases over time. What nobody really had looked at is though um, what the contribution of General, general hospital admissions. So we were kind of want to look at our data and we found about 200 patients with dementia with Lewy bodies and matched them to um, 800 people with dementia with Alzheimer's disease and looked at their hospitalization patterns to general hospitals, not to psychiatric hospitals. And what we basically found that they had uh, in the year after diagnosis about 50% more hospital admissions they spent four more additional days in hospitals and had about 500 pounds higher annual hospitalization costs. Of course, that, that is kind of UK data. I think in other healthcare systems, those differences might be much higher. Um, this is just the survival curve. This shows that um, the patients with dementia with Lewy bodies are admitted much earlier after they have received the diagnosis. But I guess when, when we really kind of calculate, use the results and now take the 80,000 people with dementia with Lewy bodies in the UK and compare them to the equal number, to an equally large group of patients with Alzheimer's disease, 80,000 people with Alzheimer's disease, and they will have an excess of 27,000 hospitalizations. They spend over 300,000 days more in hospital than the same group of patients with Alzheimer's disease and occur more than 35 million additional hospitalization costs. So um, this just tells us that um, I guess it is really worth investing in better 
care for patients with DLD because they are, there are potential cost savings in this area and probably also in other areas. Um, lastly, I wanted just to draw your attention kind of to this core feature of fluctuating cognition with pronounced variations in attention alertness um, and how this kind of um, might interact with, for example, uh, with episodes of delirium, a frequent cause for admission, of course, for people with dementia and people with dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, and of course, they are described as delirium-like occurring as spontaneous alterations of cognition, attention, and arousal. Um, so they are part of the um, Lewy body dementia picture. Um, and there has been a relatively old study now, but really uh, it set the research ag agenda a little bit where, where they found that a history of suspected delirium is more common in dementia with Lewy body than Alzheimer's disease. And in this study, this was like a tertiary referral center and they looked at 85 cases of Lewy body dementia and 95 cases of Alzheimer's disease. And just by reading the records, they found that 25% of the DLD cases and only 7% of the cases of Alzheimer's disease had a history of delirium in the run-up to their diagnosis. And I mean, the more recent also kind of research criteria for prodromal um, dementia with Lewy bodies, delirium is also now mentioned. And just, is, we just wanted to replicate basically this study in our data, just um, in a larger cohort and maybe also look what actually happens after a diagnosis of dementia. So again, we got our cohort of roughly 200 people with dementia with Lewy bodies, matched them to 800 people with Alzheimer's disease, took the initial dementia diagnosis, and then looked how many delirium episodes they had in the year before diagnosis and how many delirium episodes they had in the year after diagnosis, um, and, and compared the two. I mean, and the first finding really is, um, so green is Lewy body dementia and blue is Alzheimer's disease, that all delirium episodes more delirium episodes in DLB, regardless of be if it's before or after diagnosis, and regardless if you only measure the hospitalized ones or also the ones that are mentioned in a community or kind of on our mental health record. Um, but what was actually a bit more interesting is if you take dementia with Lewy bodies, the number of delirium episodes plummets from like from 17.6 to 6. 1.5 after a diagnosis of dementia is made. So kind of establishing the diagnosis of dementia results in um, having less diagnosis of, um, of deliriums, which only happened in dementia with Lewy bodies um, and not really made any difference or no, at least no statistically difference in, in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So again, the the question is what, what actually happened. I think the most likely explanation is probably a change in clinician behavior that some of them at least they don't know now that is a part of this um, Lewy body dementia picture. They might have started an acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, which are known to have relatively good um, effectiveness in Lewy body dementia. They get higher care input. There might potentially be less misattribution. So establishing a diagnosis of dementia uh, might reduce episodes misclassified as delirium in patients with DLB but not in AD, which is important because, um, of course, patients with DLB at a higher risk of severe sensitivity reactions to antipsychotics and a proactive diagnosis might mitigate this risk. But it's, of course, also important not to miss an, an episode of delirium due to a physical cause as well. And I guess this is all part of a, a larger research project funded by the Alzheimer Society, which kind of is, which we are doing together with the University of Cambridge, um, which is about determining the predictors and outcomes of dementia with Lewy bodies using e-clinical records, data linkages, and NLP algorithms to really improve diagnosis and management. And, and I think that because the patients with dementia with Lewy bodies, they are just very difficult to recruit into clinical trials. Um, because of just the severity of their symptoms, it is important we are now trying to go via this routine care path and, and create larger cohorts that are available for research. Um, and just one plug for something completely different, if you haven't heard of it, um, and, and you are seeing pe potentially people with dementia with Lewy body, uh, definitely download the assessment and management toolkit from the uh, from Newcastle University's 
a Diamond Louis program, which they have really, which is a, a large NIH, was a large, uh, is a large NIHR funded program, and they really have ama amazing toolkits, both for the diagnosis and really very uh, to the point sheets you can use to optimize management, and it will give you pointers what to do uh, in every situation, be it um, urinary incontinence or sleep problems or hallucinations and so forth. So, okay, so now it's just time for me kind of to thank you to my team, which is the team around the Chris Research. It's a very large team, so I haven't uh, mentioned everyone. I think most importantly, of course, Rob Stewart, who, who oversees it all and is also an old, old age psychiatrist. Um, but it, just such, such a data source requires really an, an immense input from various so sites like administration. There's a large technical team. I mean, I'm part of the epidemiology clinical team. Um, there's a large bioinformatics, computer science, NLP team, lots of PhD students, and it's really also important to um, engage with oversight and governance, as well as kind of the local mental health trust and, and the Sheffield collaborators who have been kind of instrumental in developing the natural language processing. And yes, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>